Welcome to episode one of my podcast. Here is a snippet from today's guest. Going back to like the idea of the energy management, it's having a schedule. It's looking at, all right, what are my objectives today? And writing those out and having a blueprint. So I usually have all my clients do like a, um, a vision board where, you know, they're kind of in the middle and you can, since we're talking mostly about, you know, you're a mountain biker, so you're the hub of the wheel and then the spokes go out are like the key areas of your life. So racing, um, you know, maybe your training is its own thing too, because that could be a challenge that you're having. Life balance might be one, relationships might be one. If you have another job. I'm really excited to bring to you this week's special guest, Dr. Kristen Kahn. Dr. Chris has her doctorate in clinical psychology and a master's in sports psychology. Her personal philosophy is happy racers go faster. She works with Olympians, dancers, musicians, cyclists, runners, and even yours truly. That's right. I started working with Dr. Chris a few months ago. I figured there's always room for improvement and to have an objective person to talk about all the things going on not only as an athlete, but in my personal life so that I can be the best version of myself and equipped to deal with anything that comes my way. Dr. Chris is also an athlete herself. She previously was a ballerina and also a competitive cyclist. As achievers, there's so much more than just the physical side of our experiences and Dr. Chris definitely has a lot of those experiences. Our emotions and self-talk drastically affect not only our sport, but how we perceive and move through our daily lives. Dr. Chris has built her practice, Kaim Performance Consulting, to help her clients work on emotions such as anxiety, fear, self-doubt, lack of motivation, to cultivate their brightest and most successful versions of themselves. And I know that we've all experienced these feelings and it's not shrinking away from them, but accepting them and understanding that these feelings are okay and how to manage them. In this episode, we cover what a therapist actually does, perfectionism, a healthy way to approach body image and body weight, which is always a challenge for athletes and people alike, but definitely for athletes self-worth and where to get your self-worth from, the power of meditation, and how to deal and process negative thoughts. I'm super excited to bring to you long form audio content aside from all the other fun ways I've been delivering content to you guys in the past. But today's topic is going to be about the power of your mind. For me, there's been a lot of different challenges I've taken on in my life. I've gotten my master's degree in electrical engineering. I've traveled around the world taking on the the hardest mountain bike races and put myself in really challenging situations. I've quit jobs that I've had and started businesses. And there's a lot of emotional and mental energy that's expended whenever you're challenging yourself. And a lot of times we're so focused as athletes on getting stronger physically, but getting stronger mentally actually gives you a major edge. And as an endurance athlete, the mental aspect starts becoming even more important than the physical aspect the longer the things get. And even with shorter course events, the pressure and the stress of that, and also of just being a business professional, having meetings, having difficult conversations, being able to stay positive in your mind and having the tools to overcome things when they happen to you, when things don't go your way, how do you react to it? And what choices are you going to make? And mental strength is a muscle just like physical strength and it's something that needs to be worked at. We can actually rewire our brains in order to think in a positive feedback loop instead of a negative feedback loop through gratitude practices and through changing the lens by how you view the world. It's with great excitement that I bring to you Dr. Kristen Keim. Today we have Dr. Kristen Keim, a clinical sports psychologist on the podcast. She has her master's degree in sports psychology and her doctorate in clinical psychology. So welcome, Dr. Chris. Hi, thanks for having me. We're so happy to have you as a guest on this podcast. 
and you work with so many amazing athletes. Can't wait to pick your brain and see how our listeners can benefit in both sport and in their daily life. So what made you want to work with athletes? You know, that's a good question. I think the main thing was when I, you know, I was a competitive cyclist focusing more on the road. And, but before that, I was actually danced at the professional level in mainly ballet, but modern. And then I grew up playing, you know, pretty high level competitive tennis and soccer. So I've always been kind of an athlete or performer at a pretty high level. Um, and just like the athletes that I work with, I definitely went through lots of challenges mentally, physically, and just was always intrigued with that piece. I was lucky to have uh, mentors and teachers and coaches who also kind of understand the central nervous system and that connection of the mind and body. And so when I was actually racing on my last team, I started to kind of understand like some of the more like depression and some anxiety and more clinical and other challenges that a lot of athletes do have and and struggle with. Um, And it started fascinating me. So just doing my own research around it, I found out that there was this job, you know, called a sports psychology consultant. And that was kind of what led me uh, down the path of deciding to go and do this work. When I started my program at John F. Kennedy University out in the Bay Area, I was just focusing at first on my master's in sports psychology, where you learn more about, you know, the philosophical aspects and the philosophies around motivation and confidence and, you know, a lot of these more of the mental strategies and tools and mental training um, that a consultant would do. But I had a professor who also kind of encouraged me. We take a kind of a counseling course where you, you know, learn kind of the basic skills of counseling and listening and understanding maybe when an athlete has more of a clinical issue going on too and how to do proper um, referral process. And and she just encouraged me because, you know, I, you have a really good clinical kind of natural lens as well, just picking up on some of those issues. And she was, you know, encouraged me to maybe think about going more of the clinical route as well after my master's and maybe possibly going in and getting my doctorate in clinical psychology, which is what I ended up doing. And, you know, and it was, it was perfect marriage at that program. They kind of let you do both where I was able to do a lot of my research and my dissertation actually working with the athletic population in more of the clinical aspect and lens as well. Um, So I was really lucky to have the opportunity um, to kind of pursue that vision and that lens that I wanted to do, integrating my own experience as an athlete into also kind of what my work is as a um, clinical sports psychologist. Yeah, that's great. I mean, with all the different sports that you participated in, that brings a wide range of experience. So not only can you look at it from a clinical perspective, but from a personal perspective of actually having been there yourself in some of these highly challenging and somewhat anxious situations as a ballerina, as a tennis player. I actually played tennis growing up as well. So I definitely understand the the mental aspect of choking as a tennis player. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so we hear so much about mental health these days, and there used to be a stigma that you have to have a problem or be mentally broken to work with a therapist or psychologist. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times now, it seems really common for people who, quote, seem normal to have a psychologist or a therapist. And I personally have benefited from working with you. And when should people use a psychologist, whether they're in sports, whether they're just a recreational person or maybe not an athlete at all? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, I think it's really interesting that you, you know, you mentioned reaching out and our work together because there is um, part of that stigma is the kind of the roles. Um, Like I did talk about when I was getting my master's, it would be as a sports psychology consultant where I wouldn't be working with an athlete on clinical issues. Now they could have, you know, anxiety disorder or depression, but I would be focusing more on the sport and the mental training and like the focus or goal setting or whatever challenges that were hindering that performance aspect, right? So I wouldn't be clinically working on their anxiety or depression. As a clinical sports psychologist, you know, it, then it kind of bleeds over where you could focus on variants. So I could work on, you know, if they were having something related to the anxiety or the depression or the performance, you know, that then there's that lens that, you know, I understand kind of both of those worlds with that athlete. But, you know, it's funny, the people that talk, talk about that they work with someone or don't, obviously, I'm not going to talk about working with someone unless they first do, right? So if they are comfortable with it, 
and find and talk about like, hey, I work with the sports psychologist or they're part of my village or I have my coach and my sports psychologist. That's great. That's probably the next step that we need to go with with ending the stigma. Does that make sense? Um, I think that it's still seen as like there if people know that I work with that person, then they might think that I have a mental illness or there's something wrong with me versus, you know, it's pretty normalized that you would talk about who your coach is. Now, some people might not talk about their coach because they just want to keep that secret or they don't want other people to work with that coach or, you know, whatever reason. But I think it just needs to be normalized that, again, like you said, it's you don't have to have a problem. If you want to be the top level, I mean, I, and I'm obviously I'm biased, but I do really, truly believe There's so many valuable skills that come from working with a therapist, whether it's just a sports psychology consultant, a MFT, marriage family licensed therapist, clinical psychologist, because it's that you're working on your skills as a human. And that's kind of the way that I work is, yes, you're an athlete, but you're a human being first. And so anything that we work on sport related, we're going to first also address whatever that challenge that's coming up in your life because that's the thing whatever is the challenge or you know you may not think you have a challenge but typically there's something once we start working that we could work on obviously because no one's perfect you know then 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 it's also bleeding over into your real life right so when someone says well I only get you know nervous or I only have like pre-race anxiety before races and I'm like well it doesn't anxiety doesn't work like that no like, I'm sure there's other areas that you get triggered you just again you don't have that it's the forest for the trees you're not aware of it because you're in it that's the valuable part is having someone who's not your friend your husband your wife your boyfriend girlfriend your sister your mom you know your family or whatever to talk to you know I'm coming at it with a different no biases and you know around who you are because I didn't grow up in your network and a fresh lens. And obviously I have, you know, the training of being able to look at these things and, you know, the access, the right tools that might help you, whether it's cognitive behavioral therapy or humanistic uh, tools, or, you know, just whatever kind of strategies that might help you as an individual, but then also end up helping you as an athlete. Does that make sense? Yeah, so basically, if somebody is interested in becoming the best version of themselves and learning how to work through things that come up daily in life and get a different perspective and have an objective listener is really helpful to be the best you can be. And there doesn't even have to be anything wrong. And I know for me personally, I came to you not only to get better in my head for for sports, but to work on my skill set in my own interpersonal relationships in my life so that I could maximize my relationships with people. And the the sport implications have has been really great, but I've also really enjoyed thinking and being more aware of how I act in my daily life and how I can be that best version of myself. Yeah, no, completely. And I think and again, that's it, you know, with every client that I work with, everyone's different and everyone's going to come see, you know, work with me for different reasons. And that's, that's why I love my job. You know, I don't have a cookie cutter system. The way I work with any client is not going to be the same that I work with someone else. Now, I, as a sports psychologist, I do see a lot of themes, you know, at the top level, you know, there is a lot of perfectionism and, you know, what we call type A or perfectionism or, you know, Y'all are typically a lot of the top level athletes are kind of what I joke and say, you know, your worst enemy. Someone else isn't going to do anything worse than what you can do to yourself about beating yourself up and if you're not being perfect or not achieving your goals. That's hard, you know, after, especially, you know, as you progress in your career and your life and development as a person, years of that can take its toll. And so, again, like you said so eloquently, like it's just learning the proper tools to work on that, healthier coping mechanisms, basically. Yeah, that that definitely is a good point. And especially in endurance sports and ultra endurance sports, there's such a massive mental component. It's it there's a certain point where the physical aspects become equal or even less than the mental aspects. And in my personal experience, the biggest thing that holds us back in our lives is ourself, whether it's in sport or whatever else you're trying to do in your life. So how do you address self-talk and what are some good strategies for doing that? Yeah, so self-talk, it's interesting because it seems pretty easy or, you know, elementary. It's like, okay, self-talk. I'm just going to tell myself to think a different way. It's probably one of the more challenging, but it's one of the most important and typically one of the first things I start with. So I like, so self-talk is about 
the cognitions, right? So it's a thought, you know, some reason of what we're thinking is creating this internal dialogue is what it is. Now, if we're trying to be aware of our internal dialogue and our self-talk, and it's usually negative or unrealistic or not helpful, then then often we need to, we call what the school thought is called positive uh, self-talk. Now, I dance around the word positive, just like I have kind of this thing about goal setting. Some of these words become very cliche and, and take away the cognitive kind of element where, you know, just because I say it's positive self-talk, does it mean you're saying like happy butterflies or sunshine and sprinkles and glitter or whatever, right? <laughs> unicorns. Right, exactly. That's why I, I usually say unicorns. I like to almost say more of just like helpful self-talk or mindful self-talk or realistic. You know, those, that's kind of what you're going for. It's easy to just say positive because obviously that's the opposite of negative and you know, negative self-talk is the same thing. And sometimes people don't even realize their self-talk is negative, right? And so that's usually how I start is just, you know, I'll sometimes have athletes and clients do a log, right? So I'll hear it in our conversation. And then, but then the next piece is like, okay, so you're meeting with me for this like once a week or something. I'd like you to log when you start to have whatever I picked up on these you know, self-defeating thoughts. We also, in clinical terms, call them cognitive distortions, right? So it's overgeneralizing. It's, you know, these things that, which, you know, I really encourage if people are listening to look some of those up. There's Google. Um, cognitive distortions is like a really good way because we do it. You'll read down the list and we'll be like, oh, I do that. Oh, I do that. Oh, I did. But typically, <laughs> as a human, we tend to do not all of them all the time, but like there's some that are typically kind of like our go-tos, right? That we fall back into when we're stressed or have anxiety or have self-doubt, right? But it's good. It's educational. It's good to like know this. Again, this is another reason I think everyone should go to a therapist at least once, right? Like there's always things to work on and not seeing that as a bad thing, but seeing that as empowering. Like I just want to be a better version of myself and asking for help takes more courage and strength, but that's what it takes. But you nailed it with self-talk because that's typically what really is the root of a lot of issues is your own internal dialogue. Yeah. So once you get into that funk uh, and that negative spiral of self-talk, like you start saying things like I suck or a number of, of things enter in whatever your own negative self-talk is. So once you start saying those things to yourself, how do you pull yourself out of it? Yeah, so uh, like I was talking about with the log, so we, we start with awareness and we'll do a log and we'll just, you know, it doesn't have to be overcomplicated. I usually give them like a, you know, a structured little log. I mean, you can even go on Google and find some easy self-talk logs. There's tons on the internet. And just kind of track it, you know, get your journal and just kind of track when you're having more of the negative thoughts and then figure out the trigger. So that's another big piece. You have the thought, but what caused it? It did just pop in your head, right? So for example, you are being, you know, hesitant on a descent or something, right? And you just get mad at yourself like, why am I just, I can't do this descent. I don't know what's going on, you know, and then you just get really into a negative headspace for the rest of the race. And that in the race, you meet me or something. And you're like, hey, I don't know, I was just like in a bad headspace. Da, da, da. And so we'll break it down. And you might say, hey, I really had some negative thoughts on that descent and say, okay, so that was the trigger, right? So that was the part of the course of the race where it kind of like triggered that downward spiral of negative thinking. So then we'll go back to that, right? So then we say, okay, well, that was a trigger or your partner says something that just kind of like irritated you, right? You had the negative thought or the negative association to it. That was the trigger. So again, it's that starting with the fundamentals of the thought and the trigger, and then how do we reframe? And that's the piece you're talking about where, all right, how do we get out of that? You know, that's where I I like to really bring in the meditation, the mindfulness, because again, you've got to be really present to catch yourself. Because again, it's not going to fix itself uh, overnight. It It takes work. It is like training a muscle. You have to be aware of the triggers, the thoughts that are negative, and then how do you reframe them? And so then like homework, you write those out and then you say, okay, Now I'm going to look at these. And so I usually have people just do the thoughts and the triggers for like a week. And then we will work on, okay, how's a better way to reframe it? And then their next homework will be they have to do that on their own. But it's actually helpful for me to maybe help them in that next phase, right? So thinking about, all right, what's a healthy, productive, realistic way to reframe it? Again, doesn't have to be like, 
unicorns and, you know, you're not going to say like, oh, I love descending and I'm awesome at it. Well, I mean, that's not really going to help you descending, right? It's like, no, I'm going to focus on, you know, X, Y, Z on the descent. I'm going to look out or I'm going to take a deep breath or, you know, like what's another thing that you could be focusing on to negate that negative thought and that, to that trigger. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Like for me personally, whenever I'm racing or I'm doing something that's difficult and I have self-doubt or negative things that come up, the meditation you've mentioned, which we'll talk about in a second, has helped me stop in my tracks and not attach a story to it. So realizing it's okay for me to have a negative thought. It's not bad to have a negative thought. It's just, I don't have to react to my negative thought. And I don't necessarily have to change it into a quote positive thought. And because in some ways that changes, that negates what you're feeling. And we don't want to do that either. So finding ways to just acknowledge those feelings without letting them drag you down. Yeah, no, and that's a perfect way to, you know, I've worked with clients who were training for certain things where, yeah, your body's going to get very fatigued and it's going to hurt. But when you feel the quad or the hamstring and your legs feel heavy, that's the thing. You feel it, but it's just a perception. It doesn't mean bad. doesn't mean you're not going to be able to race, but that's the story you're writing, right? Like that's what's going on in your head. Well, yeah, that's going to lead you to get dropped or, you know, not go as fast um, versus like, all right, I'm feeling this. That's it. And it's like, I'm feeling this, but I'm going to focus on my breathing. I'm going to focus on something else besides the fact that, yes, my legs really are tired or or hurt. I'm in pain, right? So, yeah, I mean, you nailed it. Like, you don't, it's not about disassociating with it and not addressing it. It's fine to address it. It's just the story that you're creating your head around that. And usually what we do, unless you've been working on it and doing meditation and, you know, working with a therapist is as bad connotation, right? And I mean, I hear it all the time where, you know, clients just, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, I'm not good at this. And, you know, they label themselves and put themselves in boxes. And I'm just like, well, you don't know, right? Like you just, maybe you didn't do that great that one time. And then you fell into that bad habit of it. So that's the beauty of the meditation is just teaching yourself to be present with no judgment and no expectations. And that's what's going to help with the self-talk as well. And let's unpack how meditation actually works from a scientific perspective. It changes your brain how your brain functions and does it physically change your neural connections in your brain as well? And I mean, it can, I mean, you know, I think everyone's, I mean, there's tons of research around meditation um, and mindfulness practices. When I worked clinically, I worked in a hospital in a pain clinic um, in at Highland hospital in Oakland, California for some internships and for my pre-doc. And that was when I first really became affluent with the work with clients with meditation and mindfulness practice was in the pain clinic with actual patients and to see how that helped physiologically. Like obviously we were working on mood and personality challenges as well, you know, major depression, life suicidality, some access to personality disorders and stuff. But physically, I mean, people that were, you know, addicted or actually, you know, on pain meds, but also actually, you know, realistically did have um, not just psychosomatic disorders, but pain it was remarkable how that helped. Um, but, you know, just like anything with the brain, just like we do with the repetition and all the miles and the training with the cardiovascular input and what you're doing physically, you've got to train the meditation, right? And so I think that's the challenging part is there's not like a, you know, there's we've done like 12 week programs or, you know, you can do 10 weeks or that's the, still the piece from a neurological standpoint. We don't have like definitive pieces, but that kind of, I feel like takes away from the, it like the beauty of meditation and mindfulness is you don't need to have 12 weeks to feel like it's going to work, right? So I think it's just being present of the journey of self-awareness and and just trusting that you're doing something good for your body and your mind, that's where the benefits come from. You know, that self-fulfilling prophecy in a healthy manner. Um, And so I encourage it for everyone. I mean, you don't need to be having a challenge. It's just be like, okay, I want to exercise and I want to get vitamin D and, you know, I want to eat healthy and I want to sleep well. And that's going to make me, you know, be the best version. It is. Meditation is going to just be another part of that. That's the lens that I would love to see us go forward with. So going back to the neurological component, yes, it definitely changes brain waves and it definitely changes, um, you know, mood disorders. We've been able to see improvements in anxiety and depression, but also physiologically helping, you know, cancer patients and, you know, people with chronic illnesses. You know, I actually do have a chronic illness and 
the meditation definitely keeps, you know, my symptoms at bay and, and helps me when I'm in remission. So that's, and I've been doing meditation for over 10 years and my own practice, like my own daily practice. So it definitely needs to be something that's just not like a fix. It's a lifestyle. Yeah. And I, I think one of the challenges of meditation is the perception of meditation. And I know that there's lots of information out there about it and I've written my own posts about it and you don't have to be sitting on this like special cushion <laughs> in this enlightened state. I mean, you can just sit at your kitchen table and put your hands on your legs and close your eyes. And I also think that because a lot of us have all or none thinking, especially as athletes, mm -hmm. we think, well, like, I don't think I can do it every day. And because they don't think they can do it every day, people won't even get started. So will you see benefits of meditation if you just do it like once a week and eventually start building more into your daily habits? I actually think you need to start on daily. Does that make sense? So I do feel like with anything with the mental training, you know, like if I was going to work on, you know, some self-talk or any tools, just like when I start with a new client, I really think it's good to kind of get some sessions in, you know, weekly at first, just to get that momentum because it is something, to, I mean, obviously even, you know, something is better than nothing, right? But I'll be very you know, honest. I, I think it would be better and more advantageous if someone was to, it's 10 minutes is what I tell people. It's like, all right, we have a bigger issue if you can't do 10 minutes of, you know, <laughs> listening to like Headspace or something, right? Because actually that's good, that's good diagnostics information, right? Like if you're really having a hard time, just, you know, again, like you said, you don't need to be Zen Buddha style when you're doing it. You can just like be wherever you're comfortable for 10 minutes. That's it. And listen to it. And then, you know, yeah, if it's challenging, more reason you need to do it, right? But I, I do feel like you need to do it more consecutively at first and just get used to it. And don't give up. If it's challenging, that then that's the more reason to keep doing it, right? So because it's teaching you something about yourself. Like, wow, I am really, I've got a lot going on in my brain if I can't just be okay enough to give myself that self care for 10 minutes in the day, right? Yeah, and being okay with the fact that you have lots of thoughts coming into your brain and not, not judging. The, the goal isn't to get rid of the thoughts. The goal is to just recognize the thoughts when they're there. Yeah. I always think it's funny when people are like, I'm failing at headspace or I'm failing at meditation. <laughs> I'm like, that is the, that it goes against exactly what we're trying to do. Right. But, um, but I love it because it's a great educational entry where I'm just like, yep, that you've got all kinds of judgment and expectation. So stay with it, you know, focus what is causing that where that's that perfectionism, right? That's that going back to that self-talk and just, yeah, it's a journey. And I tell people, it's like, you're, it might be challenging. But remember when you first started training or racing, that was really hard, right? But eventually people start to really see how it works. And then that is, that's it. Like if you just give it enough time and you have patience with no judgment on yourself around it, then yeah, it's remarkable what it can be. And, you know, and, and then once you get good at it, if life gets busy or race schedule gets busy, you know, it, do you need to be doing it every day? I would recommend it, but you know, things happen. You're, you raced all day. Like that might not be the top priority, but you don't have to do a headspace. You know, it's like, you could just be meditating by stretching, right? Just be in a space in your head where there's no judgment, no expectation. You're not, you know, you're not thinking about the past, what coulda, shoulda, wouldas. You're not thinking about the future. You're just there. You're just feeling your muscles. You know, you're just focusing on your breathing. Um, you, know, you could be listening to music. Um, you can kind of go zen. I mean, I actually feel like a lot of times I don't race anymore, but my riding my bike is. And I like to ride with people, but a lot of times I like to ride solo because I just want to get out on my local greenway here. And I mean, I, I, sometimes I, I'm surprised I don't like ride my bike off into the river, right? Because I'm just like so <laughs> zoned out, right? I'm just feeling the muscles and just, you know, that, that rotation is so beautiful of the pedal, right? So for me, that is a meditation. And that's why I don't ever want to compete again, because I don't want, I don't want to tarnish that piece. And so for athletes that are, that's their job, you can't really have both. Like that can't really be your meditation. Now, if you wanted to be, go running on the side or do yoga or, you know, go for a hike or just, you know, sit quietly or color, right? Coloring is a great thing or do art. That's another beautiful thing that can be kind of a meditative experience too. Yeah, that's great. Well, I'm going to change gears here okay. a little bit and uh, talk about something a, a bit different. So people think that other people that exercise, especially people who ride their bike or run or do triathletes for many hours at a time, they can just eat whatever they want and never gain weight. And 
I actually thought that when I first started cycling and I was eating like all these cookies and I ended up gaining all this weight <laughs> my first year as a cyclist. <laughs> and the reality is that a lot of us, especially at the elite level, but also at the recreational level, are very focused on our diet and always trying to find ways to, to either get a performance benefit or to lose weight so we can go faster uphill. And it seems that in endurance sports, there's a lot of focus on body weight and body image. And that kind of breeds anxiety around food and how we view food and how we view our bodies to the point of having eating disorders. And mm -hmm. it's really common for top level racers in all different disciplines of endurance sports. And even in other sports, like I know in, in dance, especially eating disorders are really a commonality. So mm -hmm. how should we view our food and our body as, as athletes? Yeah, that's a great topic. Um, I actually just finished up a, an article on that where and I, well, I gave a talk locally on it too, but it's a delicate topic. And, you know, it kind of goes, it goes along with the whole stigma, you know, around, uh, you know, I work a lot with specifically with depression and, and things like that with athletes and, you know, the mindfulness and the eating disorders is another really clinical issue that it's like it's there, but we've normalized it. But it's also delicate as in, if a client, so if an athlete just went to a clinical psychologist, didn't understand the sport context, they might actually think they had more of an eating disorder, but they don't because their activities of daily live, like they're fine, but they do have to do some pretty drastic changes to their diet because, you know, they're trying to meet a certain weight ratio, power weight ratio. But I think that's also the issue that I'm seeing within a lot of the endurance based sports, um, particularly, or even like I work with like, you know, MMA fighters and people like that too. It's, the culture has normalized that, you know, it's okay to be unhealthy thin, right? It's okay to be lower than what you probably physically need to be. And it's okay to, you know, basically starve yourself. And, or worse, when people clearly have an eating disorder or, or struggling, because just like depression at the clinical level, once you've been diagnosed clinically with it, there's not a cure. It's not like you just, it goes away. No, it's something you're going to have to be working on and monitoring for the rest of your life. And I think that's a misconception is that what led to just, you know, me trying to be thin, it spiraled out of control to a clinical eating disorder. Well, once I'm doing better, I'm just going to jump back into racing and everything's going to be fine. That's doing disservice to the athlete um, because that's a highly toxic environment to try to stay healthy. And so, I mean, I usually recommend years of separation, you know, once you've had a clinical issue to before you get back into competitive racing, because I just feel like that's just perpetuating the struggle and the prevention of it happening again. And so that's more of the clinical kind of side of it. But again, it starts with what you talked about, right? It starts with unrealistic expectations, whether it's, you know, like you said, that you just felt like, well, I could eat whatever I wanted to, right? And I'd be okay. And then all of a sudden you're like, whoa, I'm actually gaining weight. But then that's what happens is that person starts to say, okay, you start to think about your body in a different way. Because before the racing, it was just like, well, I ate to be healthy or just ate and I ate and, you know, I had high metabolism or whatever. But then you start to realize how that, how that impacts your performance. That's actually where it starts to get kind of fuzzy, right? A little gray area. Because then the body, the food is not just as a fuel or an activity that you do for pleasure or with your family or friends or whatever. It is impacting your performance. And it, and it is. But that's what leads to more of the disordered eating patterns or obsessions with body, uh, with food. And then, then, con then the next step is the body image equating of, you know, if I'm eating this then that, or not eating this much, then I'm going to get thinner or I'm going to get leaner. And this is what my body's going to look like. And my body needs to look like this to do well. That's the issue is when we start to think that I have to be at a certain weight and I have to look a certain way and that's the only way I'm going to perform. Yeah, or people will love me more if I look a certain way or people will think more highly of me oh, if I look a certain way. Oh, I feel more like an way. athlete. Oh, I hear that all the time. Like, I don't feel like an athlete unless I look this way or weigh this way, weight. People won't think I'm an athlete if I don't look this way. Like, if I don't look like this other athlete, then they're not going to think I'm an athlete versus you probably are a stronger athlete, Right. But it's, I mean, it's not, it's not your, I mean, it's your, it is a challenge and it is a problem, but it, this culture has perpetuated that, 
Like, you know, that, where does it start? Or when, when, how do we end that, right? Where we need to celebrate all body types and get away from, you know, oh, they're a climber or they're a sprinter or they're, you know, these putting people in these toxic boxes, basically, and limiting themselves. I mean, obviously, there's going to be things like you are probably not going to be a Tour de France climber, but don't negate that you don't want to keep working on your climbing in a healthy way, right? In a meeting, learning with your coach, working with your sports psychologist, working with your physiologist and, you know, nutritionist or whatever, and doing it in a healthy manner where you've got the proper resources and you're not just reading stuff off the internet or taking really bad advice. Yeah, I mean, and even as people who aren't athletes, just in general, when you look at teenage girls or or not even teenage girls, just anybody, everybody has some level of insecurity about their body image and focusing on, oh, I I wish my body would look this way or I wish I could do this or having guilty feelings Mm -hmm. around eating food, which actually ends up messing up your willpower, having more guilt weakens your willpower. Mm -hmm. So what are some tools that that people out there who, because all of us have some shade of a body image problem, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. What are some tools to look at your body and and to love your body for, for what it is? Yeah. And you know, that really comes down to the individual, right? So again, we're going to go back to that underlying trigger or that underlying issue. Like you said, it, it usually is the body image is twofold. So there's the athletic piece, performance based piece, but it's also the confidence piece, the imposter syndrome, you know, not thinking that you're like XYZ or worrying about what others perceptions are. So again, it's developing a healthy relationship with your body and seeing all its strengths and seeing it as a tool, not just as an athlete, but as a human, like you're healthy and you're moving. You know, that actually happened to me the other day. Um, and I wrote a piece on it and we're, Obviously, I'm a cyclist, and I have really bad cycling tan lines that are going to be tattoos forever, right? (laughs) But I love running, and, like, not many people know that I'm a runner. And But I I feel so like an imposter when I run because, you know, I'm very – I'm not built like a really – like a professional runner. I mean, I guess if I started running more and I lost a lot of muscle on my legs, I probably would be. But I've just built up, you know, a lot of leg muscle with my cycling and dancing and stuff. And but that's how I always think. And here I am a doctor. I mean, yeah, I'm a sports psychologist. And I still catch myself thinking that's so silly that I feel uncomfortable running with people that are more runners and have that identity because I I that's not my sport, right? That's not where I feel confident. I don't know. Like there's a lot of unknowns, but then I was out running on the trails and I was just like, no, I'm just happy. I'm able to run, right? Like I just have the ability to even just go run in the woods and what a beautiful thing. And so I had to have that own self-talk reframing with myself. And so that's usually what I would start with, with someone is just looking at your body as this beautiful vessel for all these things that you get to do, right? You get to be hug people, you get to touch your baby or your partner, right? And it's it's not objectifying our bodies to ourselves. So others, society objectifies things, but we do that too, where we just see this as this negative object versus like, look at our my heart's beating. Again, going back to that meditation and just honoring the breath and honoring that you have this, you're alive and that you're healthy and that you're moving. And even when I have clients that are injured, it's like, don't be mad about the injury, but be like, all right, I'm going to think positive, helpful things that's going to improve the injury, right? The help that, you know, get that blood stimulation to that. So it's the same thing. It's r- having a different story and dialogue around association with your body, along with figuring out where other triggers, right? So is it a confidence issue? Is it unrealistic expectations? Is it, you know, judging yourself or Um, comparing yourself to others, right? So those would be other things that we might address and figure out, you know, what would be the best advantageous way to work on those things. Yeah, something that's been really helpful for me is I caught myself when every time I look in the mirror, I immediately look at the things I don't like. That's the very first place my eyes go. And I was able to catch myself doing that. So now when I look in the mirror, when if if I do that, Mm -hmm. and I do almost every single time, I make myself stop. And then I make myself take a deep breath. And then sometimes out loud I do it, but I still feel a little bit uncomfortable even saying it out loud. Yeah. But I'll think or say out loud five things about my body that I like. Yeah. And trying to retrain my brain to look at my body in a positive way and to start looking at the things that I like about myself instead of focusing on the things that I don't like about myself. Yeah. And that's a good thing. Again, like I said, that's a powerful 
for some people, now some people would not be at a stage to do that, right? Like that actually Mm -hmm. could be really challenging and may actually cause more anxiety and stress, right? So Mm -hmm. again, it would just be up to, that's why it's hard for me to ever talk about like concrete tools or strategies, except for like generalizations, like self-talk and like goal setting or like things that we would kind of work on. Because like I said, if it's, if it's just a body image and it's not like a clinical level, like that would probably be more appropriate, like exactly what you're doing. But if someone has an eating disorder or has something more clinical, that would probably be, be something that, you know, we would, they would need to talk and address with their therapist before they tried any, you know, any other tools. The main thing would be reaching out for help, right? So if you're, even if you just start to feel like you're eating, you know, you're feeling kind of like you're, the way you view yourself and your eating habits and your body image seem to be take, preoccupying most of your life and that you're isolating yourself or just feel, feeling a sense of out of control around it and just uh, monitoring things too much, weighing yourself, you know, friends or family will start to maybe, you know, also pick up on it. I just really encourage people to reach out for help, you know, just contact someone, talk about it. And, you know, you don't have to first off talk to a therapist. I mean, that would be great, but you know, there's, you know, go to the National um, Association of Eating Disorders. There's, there's crisis lines, there's call lines you can do. There's, there's actually great information on those websites around eating disorders that also touch about body image. But just talk to someone about it. Don't isolate yourself and don't feel like there's something wrong with you because there isn't. It's something misfired in your brain and and you can work on it. Just like it just kind of came up, you can also work on it to, you know, ease the symptoms or to get more management and control over it as well. Awesome. Yeah, I'll include the article that you mentioned that you wrote as well as some of these resources in the show notes uh, whenever this podcast is out there for everybody. Great. So let's let's talk about commitment. So when you're training for a big event, it requires a lot of commitment. I've, I've heard about you know the Ironman widows or <laughs> um, in cycling people that never see their partner or their mm-hmm. family. Which a lot of people wake up early to train. They work a long day at work, and then they're trying to balance having a family. And I'm a professional athlete, but my husband also trains in races, and he's in he's in that that wheelhouse. He wakes mm-hmm. up early and he gets on his bike and then he works all day and he comes home a bit later because he, he went into work a bit later and he's always trying to find more balance and it's hard to make time for anything else in your daily life when you're so focused on training and then working and then having family time mm-hmm. so and the, it requires the support and commitment of these people's families as well because they might have to make other sacrifices like maybe they're doing more work around the house or they're having to pick up the slack because they're supporting their family member to train for a goal or a different event, or maybe it's even just somebody has to work long hours at work for a long time. Maybe they're a lawyer or whatever. Mm -hmm. So how do you avoid feelings of burnout when you're working really hard towards a goal? That's great. Actually, the first thing I'd even say is that communication with your partner. Um, You know, I do work with a lot of athletes that, you know, their partners are also professional athletes or, you know, still have jobs and still compete, right? Communication is a big piece of that, you know, and just being open and honest with each other around kind of your your goals and aspirations and working on that actually will help with what you're talking about too, is that balance, right? And so this goes for if you're a single athlete and you don't have a partner, but it sometimes can have its own different challenges when you're in a relationship with someone who also has those, you know, kind of a lot of demands, but then wants to perform at optimal level. It, I call it energy management. It's not time management, right? It's like energy management. Uh, and that's usually the main thing, right? Because I definitely know, I thought it was funny. I think it was some pro athlete wrote on uh, social media. I can't remember who it was. I want to give kudos to the people that, race professionally, but then also works like eight to 10 hours a day. And I, I did comment because I was like, well, I work with like half my clients or like that, you know, because yes, I definitely work with athletes that are, you know, seen as just pro athletes, but I also understand what else they're doing with the social media and the sponsorships and interviews and to the person outside the off, you know, it's not in that reality. It might seem like, well, that doesn't seem hard. But it is. Yeah, all they're doing is riding their bike. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, no, they're not. And, you know, they're going to the chiropractor or the PT and the massage. Like, yeah, it sounds nice, but those are torture times. Those aren't nice, nice fluff times. And that's part of their job. But you see, they're riding five hours a day. Then you're going to three different doctor's appointments. Then, you know, it's a lot, but that's your job. Their job is just different. 
right? Like, it's just, we can't put this label of, well, that's the dream job, right? And I'm like, because it's not, believe me. I mean, it's it can get just as tiring or grueling or just, you know, kind of repetitious as any job. And that's why we all need to find our, you know, what makes us happy and what we want to do and pursue, what gives us meaning and purpose. But going back to like the idea of the energy management, it's, it is that though. It is looking, it's having a schedule. It's looking at, all right, what are my objectives today? And writing those out and having a blueprint. So I usually have all my clients do like a, um, a vision board where, you know, they're kind of in the middle and you can, since we're talking mostly about, you know, you're a mountain biker. So you're the hub of the wheel and then the spokes go out are like the key areas of your life. So racing, um, you know, maybe your training is its own thing too, because that could be a challenge that you're having. Life balance might be one. Relationships might be one. If you have another job, right? So I, I work with some pro athletes who literally have another job. I mean, they, yes, their job is a pro athlete. They have a contract, they get paid, but then they also are working as an engineer, you know, on the side. Oh, yeah. it's so it's so common for pro athletes right. to have a job. Yeah, exactly. Especially women athletes, female athletes. A lot of them have to have another job because I'm sorry, like I'm just being realistic. They don't get paid the salary to be able to probably just live off of their pro contract. That would be another uh, podcast discussion. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but going back to the wheel of um, the vision board. So then you have those spokes and then we break down and we say, okay, what are my objectives in those areas? Right? So again, it's prevention. Like, so instead of just looking at that big goal or objective that you have, we've got to dial in and say, okay, what are all these little things that each day I'm going to try to work on that are going to set up the platform and the momentum for me to accomplish this end all objective, right? And then breaking it up. So I like all my clients to like break their seasons up. This whole idea of, I don't even like what the mentality of a, of an off season. I don't even like to call it that. I like to call it a transition season or period, not a season. We need more breaks. So athletes, we need to get this paradigm shift where it's like, blocks of racing and then like off the bike just you know having you know do whatever you can go travel or you can just catch up on life or you can work that week right and then have another block but this like racing until you're burned out and overtrained and then take two weeks off or a month off or whatever I've seen that has a lot of physical and psychological um, detriments to that and I've seen athletes who are doing it world tour level women's men's who have been able to kind of finesse it, where they kind of break it up, they've taught their coaches, they've got, you know, luckily they have good support from teams. And I understand like at different trajectories in your career, you may not be able to do this, but hopefully over the next few years, we see more of a shift like in that. And I am seeing it a little bit more in endurance and cycling, I should say. Definitely like in mountain bike and cross, I think it, it, it is more advantageous. The road, it sometimes might be a little bit more challenging, but where, you know, because you're, you're at the end of the season, for me, I did my job when an athlete, yeah, they're ready to be off the bike or have, you know, their transition season in like October or whatever, but they still could go race, right? They're just not like, oh, I just want to like lock that up and I don't want to see my bike and I'm so burned out and I'm so tired. Like, but that's what I kept seeing for years, right? Like everyone was just so knackered and I was like, okay, this, that's not a good way to start a new season, right? So you want to end on a high note with momentum and like, motivation and feeling like you, you know, you, you learned some great lessons. Maybe you didn't meet all your objectives, but like you felt like, Hey, that I felt like I did it as best as I could in those circumstances, you know, we'll debrief about the season. And then you just kind of like focus on some added balance. You can go ride your bike if you want to like no strategic training and stuff, but like, just go do whatever you want. Just like in another job, you'd have vacation and go do whatever you want, right? So I think that's kind of what I encourage. And so like for, you know, athletes like yourself, where you kind of do get to choose your your season, that's, I would highly um, encourage that, you know, just kind of break it up, um, energy management, because you just can't, you just can't slug it like four, three or four months straight. With all the travel and all that, it catches up. And again, prevention, it's like, the writing on the wall. Is that realistic? How are you going to be physically and mentally? Because we know you're going to, the more fit you get, the more susceptible you are to illness. If you're not, if you're stressed, your central nervous system's overtaxed, you know, more susceptible to illness. So again, I'm just trying to keep you physically and psychologically healthy, your mental welfare. And those are kind of some of the strategies that will lead to you being able to achieve your objectives. Yeah. So maybe for those who are maybe the non-pro athletes, but the people who are just working really hard, maybe it's, 
if they start getting to that point where they, they feel like this is just too much and mm-hmm. they start resenting their training and resenting everything they're doing, it's okay to take a couple days off. It's not going to set you yes. back. It's actually going to push you ahead if you are feeling burnt out and you can take a break. Or, and, and less racing. More is it yeah. better. Quality. So, you know, like... If you want to get some more races and you feel like, because I do have athletes that, you know, the racing is better. And I agree. I mean, your racing is your best training, but you've got to really understand like, okay, these are training races, which is hard to always, you know, really have that mindset, (laughs) right? So I usually tell people, I'm like, no, I'd rather you go to Moab or something and get two weeks of really hard intensity in and like really feel like an athlete and then go do like one or two key races versus I'm just going to race like six races, right? That I get anxious to thinking that saying that, right? So again, it's just picking and choosing and being realistic. And you know, it's quality over quantity. I definitely see improvements in performance by athletes just racing more with the mentality of like fewer objectives. Does that make sense? So having only a few key, I mean, honestly, if you want to say like goal races, like one that you really want to win, like you're really targeting, max three a season. Max. Yeah. Two to three. But then, yes, you can have, because on the way up to winning or getting your objective, when maybe it's top five at some really hard race, you're going to do well because you're checking off all your objectives for that race. Well, eventually leading into that, any other races, you're going to perform well, right? But I think sometimes athletes just go in with no objectives, no goals, and they just want to win. Well, I'm like, well, obviously, I mean, we have a bigger issue if you don't want to win, right? <laughs> like, that's a given. Even if you, you know, know you're in over your head, you still want to do well. But what's that look like, right? So you got to break it down. You got to look at your the mental skills, the tactical, the physical. Like, what are these little things? You know, it still like blows my mind that cl- athletes, even at pro level, still don't practice starts. I'm like. I don't care if you've been racing for 20 years, you should still be training your starts. You should still be training descent. You should still be training cornering, you know, skills. Like that's a big part of mountain biking. It's a big part of road, cross, any of that, those sports. Yeah, tri- triathlon, it's like your transitions. Oh you gosh, gotta tra- I like have triathlons. Oh yeah, I mean, I'm, we strategically schedule and rehearse their transitions. Well, and I've had some that don't do that. And I was like, well, oh, well there's a red flag right there, right? I was like, well... Dr. Com is going to make you do that. Like, I was just like, of course, I can't imagine like not training that and then get to race and not feel very grounded and confident in that. Right. So, yeah, so that's kind of the best way. And, and honestly, that's even though we talk about it and I know, you, you know, you've been doing this and you have been facilitating a lot of these things. It seems pretty like obvious, but I would say 99% of people don't do what we were just talking about. Yeah, and having your skills in check makes it more fun. It makes riding your bike more fun when you can rip faster on a around a corner on your road bike or you can just shred a, a gnarly downhill on your mountain bike without using any energy at all to do it compared to somebody else who maybe hadn't practiced those skills and really gets all worked up and they have to use all this cortisol just to get down this descent. Mm-hmm. And I think it's and it's scheduling it. So I always tell clients it, it will settle more cognitively and really have more efficacy and autonomy. That's, that's what we're working on in confidence. So confidence is more about your efficacy and your autonomy and your skills and the efficacy that you did put in this work and being accountable to yourself. I like skills days. You know, I do that a lot with my cross racers too, where it's like, Today, you know, yeah, if you need to get some endurance riding in, you separate it. You do your endurance ride, you go home, you eat, take a nap, then you go out and you do your sand pit or your intervals of climbing or running or whatever. But you need to be knowing like right now I'm working on my skills. Right. So a great way to to build confidence for yourself is to know that is to actually do the work and to recognize I've done the work to prepare for this. So there's nothing really to be nervous about because I've done the best I can preparing. I can't control what's about what might happen to me after the gun goes off at the start. So I feel good because I've done the best I can preparing. And that's where your confidence should come from, not a perfect performance. Perfect. Oh my gosh. Like that, you should do a little tape on for headspace (laughs) with that right there. That needs to be, that needs to be on repetition in every athlete's mind. That's the mindset right there that you want at a start line. Awesome. So th- this will bring us to our, our final wrap up here is your mantra. Happy racers go faster. Yeah. So all these tools that we've discussed should help you be happier in your life because you'll have better body image. You'll be able to, you know, maybe on your own or maybe with a therapist, work on your self-talk 
and the way that you view your confidence and your self-worth. So how does being a happy racer actually make you go faster? You know, for me, it started with some of my first clients. We kind of would say that, and it was kind of a joke, you know, in a way where I'd say, when you're happy, you know, your your performance would go well. And then they would start, you know, there's some younger athletes actually, like U23s, and they're like, wow, it really is you know, wow, like they started to see that correlation of like, wow, when I'm in a good headspace, I'm in a good mood, things are going good, my relationship with my girlfriend or boyfriend's good, like all these good things, I'm happy, I'm not stressed, I'm not overthinking, I'm not anxious, I'm not having all these issues. And then when they did have it, then they were having a bad performance. And so, you know, one of my clients, early ones, he said, he's like, yeah, your, you should, your slogan on your shirt or something should be like, happy racers go faster. And I was like, actually, that's genius. Because <laughs> I say it. I mean, we, we were actually would say that like in emails and I started like putting yeah. that on my signature and I was like, wow, I should really, that needs to be it. But it is. And again, it is that simple. And I feel like that's what I would want to end that message is make sure you get your village. You know, we need to reconnect with the human size sport. Like it's challenging. There's no reason that being an athlete's not any other challenging. You're still a human being. You still have imperfections. You still have mental challenges, physical challenges. I mean, there's a lot of athletes performing at the top level, myself included, um, when I was at that level um, with chronic illnesses, right? Like, it is possible, but you've got to you've got to have grace with yourself. You've got to be surrounded by a really supportive, empowering, and motivating and openly critical, you know, like just like helping you with like telling you and calling yourself out when you, you, you know, if someone needs to call you out on your stuff and that environment, that village, that's, what's going to make a happy racer and happy athlete, you know, a happy athlete is going to compete better. A happy racer is going to go faster. It is the truth. And it doesn't have to be more complicated with that. And so if you are struggling or even if you're not, and you just feel like I want to get a better mental edge or learn more about myself and work more on my performance on that aspect, then either, you know, you can definitely reach out on my website, kindperformanceconsulting.com or find someone, you know, that's why I tell people, I may not be the best fit for everyone. But I do encourage people to go down this path, because it can really not only make you obviously a happier and better athlete, but a happier, and better human being too. That's great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to come on this podcast My and pleasure. to share all of your wisdom and experience with everybody here. I'm sure everybody appreciates it and is going to use ev- all these great nuggets to get better in their life and as an athlete. So thanks so much. Thanks. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. There you have it. There is episode one of the Sonia Looney show. Thanks so much again to Dr. Chris Keim. She's so awesome. I love her. If you want to get in touch with her, check out the show notes and go to her website, keimperformanceconsulting.com. If you guys like the show and you want to support it, share it with your friends, tell them about it, go on social media, hit the subscribe button. That definitely helps us out a lot and give us a rating or a review. I've also created a Patreon page, so if you want to help support the show and help it get even better every single episode, you can go on there and you can find the link on my website. I want to thank you guys for listening, and if you want more from me, I have a short bi-weekly email that I send out, never any spam, and I just send out things that have been going on, maybe some blog post articles that you might not have seen on social media. So if you want to connect with me there, go to my website, sonyalooney.com, and there's a bunch of different places you can subscribe for my newsletter. So we will see you back here next week, same place, and I think you'll be pretty excited about my next guest. See you guys later! Later!